Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes, one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to welcome you to this service of The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so grateful that you are joining us today, and we would love to get the chance to get to know you and to see how we can be praying for you. So if you would, please take a moment and sign in using either the link that's in this video description or by scanning the QR code that will show up in your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you are participating in worship and let us know how we can be praying for you. Now I invite you to take a deep breath and prepare your hearts for worship.
join me now in prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together in your name today. Thank you that you are able to unite us together in worship, even when we are far apart. Lord, in this time, as we remember Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, would we, with those crowds, cry Hosanna. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth in this time. Would you open up our hearts and our ears and our minds to hear from you and to be impacted by the word that you give us today. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the important things that we do in worship is that we affirm our faith. And we do that because we come from different backgrounds, we have different likes and dislikes, different political views, we have different opinions on so many things. But when we come together in church, we're coming together to focus on the most important things that we hold in common. And those are the things that make up our faith. And so I invite you to join with me as we affirm our faith today using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
I'm Pastor David, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and it's my joy to lead us in the morning prayer. Now, I'm going to pause in the prayer to give you the opportunity to speak the names of persons or situations that you would like to lift up in prayer to God today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, most merciful, in the beginning you created us, and by the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only Son, you created us anew. Work in us now both to will and to do what pleases you. Grant us your grace and heavenly blessing that in whatever work we engage, we may do all to your honor and glory. Keep us from sin and empower us daily to do good works that we may always honor you, not with our words only, but with our deeds also. At that time when our earthly life has been completed, we pray that you will give us pardon for all our sins and receive us to eternal life. We especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us to live lives through which you bless others. Through Jesus Christ we pray. And as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, so now we also pray as God's confident children, praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, we believe that giving is important as an act of worship. Giving back to God out of gratitude for what God has given us. Your offerings to God help support the many ministries through our church. And you can worship God by giving offerings at a live worship service or by mailing checks to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, or through our website or our cell phone app. Let us pray. Lord God, as we reflect upon our giving, we pray that you will bless each gift and each one who gives, and use both in the ongoing work of your kingdom. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.
Hi, I'm Pastor David again, and now it's time for the children's message. So if you have children nearby who aren't already watching the video, children or youth, now's a great time to call them over because I have something to share with them I think they'll be interested to hear. So do you know what it means to be two-faced? Yeah, that's right. It means to do or say one thing one day and then later do or say something that's actually the uh, absolute opposite. Have you ever had someone pretend to be your friend? Or you thought they were a friend when they're with you, but then you find out that they're saying mean things about you behind your back. Well, uh, here's an example of being two-faced. Uh, now you see, I'm, I'm good for this because my face is very long. And so I not only have a face, but I have room for another one. And so I'm going to add another one up here. Luke. Yeah, so you know who that was, yeah. Darth Vader, right. Okay, now today is Palm Sunday. And it seems that on Palm Sunday, there were some two-faced people in the crowd. You remember the story, Jesus entered into Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey. Uh, some people were waving palm branches. Uh, others were uh, laying their coats on the street. And many people in the crowd were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But just a few days later, some of those same people were shouting something different. They were saying, crucify him, crucify him. <laughs> well, in the same way, there are still two-faced followers of Jesus today. And that's when someone comes to church on Sunday and praises the Lord. But then they go out during the week, and no one would even know that they are Christian. Some people go to church on Sunday and say, I love God. But then during the week, they lie or cheat, or they are prejudiced or mean towards people who may be different from them. It's the same as if on Sunday, another kid says, oh, I want to be your friend. But then during the week, that same kid says hurtful things about you to others and hangs out with other mean kids instead of you. Well, that's being two-faced. So what we're supposed to do instead is be consistent. We come to church on Sunday to learn about Jesus so that He will be with us all week long. We come to church to learn how Jesus wants us to act towards others. And then all week long, we should be putting that into practice. We should treat others the way Jesus has taught us to treat others and the way that we would like to be treated. So, be careful about being two-faced, where you're friendly with one face, but mean with the other. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the children and youth of our church and community and all those watching this video today and their families. Help us not to be two-faced, but to be faithful to Jesus on Sunday and every other day of the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I really appreciate the fact that you've taken time to worship with us today. We're finishing up our series on the Lord's Prayer. So let's go right to the scripture, to Matthew chapter 6. And let's hear this prayer once again. Jesus is teaching the disciples at the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, when you are praying, do not heap up empty praises as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. That's the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and all the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable to you. You are truly our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this may not be the most typical Palm Sunday sermon that you've ever heard. As I mentioned, we're finishing up our series on the Lord's Prayer today. Uh, But I can't think of a better backdrop to Jesus' concluding line of that prayer than his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And you know that last line. We just prayed it together and we just heard it. And it is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now if you look back in your Bibles, back in Matthew chapter 6, you'll see that this line isn't always in there. Um, In fact, um, I've been reading through Matthew. Matthew doesn't include that line at all. It's more than likely not part of the original prayer that Jesus taught, although it was being used as part of the Lord's Prayer as early as the first century. It's what we call a doxology or a shout of praise in response to the prayer. So Jesus' prayer actually ends with lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then the early church added, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This last line, it begins with the word for. That seems like such a simple little word that might easily be overlooked, but it's actually a really important word. This little preposition is saying, in essence, the reason we are praying all these things is for or because of the kingdom and the power and the glory already belongs to God who made them. When we pray the words of this doxology, we not only acknowledge God's power, we're also making a statement of faith. Because yours is the kingdom, the power and glory, O God, I know that you're with me and that you hear my prayer. I know that you're able to provide for our daily needs. I know that you can rescue us from evil. I know that you forgive the debts that imprison us, freeing us to spread that forgiveness to others. For thine is the kingdom. In considering this statement, two of my professors at Duke Divinity School, Bishop Will Williman and noted ethics professor Stanley Hauerwas wrote, here comes politics again, as we attempt to pray as Jesus taught us to. They note that the Lord's Prayer, particularly this line, is a pledge of allegiance to a king and his kingdom that throws all other allegiances into crisis. Have you ever thought about the Lord's Prayer in that way? I'm not sure that I had. But it's truly a pledge of allegiance to God's kingdom, power, and glory. And this pledge and this allegiance to God's kingdom, power, and glory are meant to come before all other allegiances that we hold. Chuck Colson, the special counsel to President Richard Nixon, served seven months in prison for his role in obstructing justice related to the Watergate scandal. Shortly before his prison sentence began, he became a follower of Jesus Christ. And after his release, he became a very important and thoughtful Christian leader. In fact, Pastor David, with us on our staff, used to work with Chuck Colson in his prison ministry from 1983 to 1991. Well, in his book, Kingdoms in Conflict, Colson noted that throughout history, the church with its pledge to the kingdom of God has often come in conflict with the kingdoms of this earth. As an example, I mentioned last Sunday that the great majority of Christians in Germany during World War II participated in the Nazi regime or were silent about their atrocities. But there were some who resisted. Some who resisted precisely because of their allegiance to God's kingdom. Colson notes that Nazi files clearly record that the church struggle was a constant thorn in the flesh to Hitler and his aides during their early years in power. It was a credit 
to the church's reliance on an ultimate authority and vision quite apart from the political order that led Christians to resist Hitler and his blasphemous claims, even though his political popularity was soaring. The church, Coulson wrote, was the only institution in Germany that offered any meaningful resistance. One of the churches that made an enduring difference was right across, across the border in France, a country that was occupied by Germany in World War II. In 1987, a man named Pierre Sauvage made a film about the town of his birth in occupied France called Les Chambons. Sauvage, his parents, and at least 5,000 Jews survived because their Christian neighbors organized to protect them from the Nazis and deportation to the concentration camps that would inevitably follow. Savage made his film Weapons of the Spirit in an attempt to understand why an entire community would put themselves at mortal risk in order to save others they didn't even know. Savage learned of a sermon preached by the local pastor, Andre Trocme, whose words helped galvanize the villagers. He said in a sermon, the duty of the Christian is to resist the violence that will be brought to bear on their consciences through the weapons of the spirit. We shall resist when our adversaries shall demand of us obedience that goes contrary to the orders of the gospel. We shall do so without fear, but also without pride and without hatred. And that's what this community of mostly poor farmers did. They took Jewish refugees into their homes. They lied to the authorities. They set up an underground railroad to smuggle Jews across the border into neutral Switzerland. Engaging in what Savage labeled a conspiracy of goodness, the villagers offered such a powerful witness through their actions that as word spread through quiet back channels, Jews from other areas of France made their way to Les Chambon for protection, so that eventually there were as many Jews in the area as there were French Christians. Local officials of the Vichy government, which occupied, excuse me, which cooperated elsewhere with the German occupiers in rounding up Jews, they actually joined in on the conspiracy. After discovering the rescue effort, even some of the German soldiers and officers that were stationed in the area chose to help keep the secret rather than reporting to their superiors what was happening in Les Chambon. In this way, all of these people faced a crisis of allegiance and they chose God's kingdom over earthly powers. As Sauvage came to believe, when people concertedly engage in goodness, it becomes contagious, spreading in unforeseen, unimaginable ways, even into the hearts of enemies who are then converted into co-conspirators. Nevertheless, despite such efforts, many church people, including their pastors and leaders, capitulated to Hitler. They either didn't want to rock the boat, or worse, they actually embraced the Nazi rhetoric. In the end, the church failed to hold the state to account. I mentioned last week that more than 90% of Nazi Germany was Christian. These people prayed the Lord's Prayer, yet most failed to understand or live into what they were actually praying. Today, our praying this prayer, our pledging of allegiance to God and God's kingdom, means that we must ask probing questions of our nation and of its leaders. Is this law, is this piece of legislation, is this executive order, is this policy, is it consistent with the values that we have pledged ourselves in the Lord's Prayer? Is my personal support, your personal support of this policy, this law, this position, is it consistent with your pledge recognizing that the kingdom, the power, and the glory belong to God and to Him alone? Of course, each of us also has some degree of power, right? Much of this power comes from God. Jesus, in fact, promised the disciples that the Holy Spirit would come upon them and would give them power, and it happened at Pentecost. They and we would have power to be witnesses. We have power to influence, power to act, power to do God's work. And we can use this power to impact others' lives and the world around us. But there's also another kind of power. 
The power of our position in the workplace. The power of our economic means. The power of our influence with others and our relationships. Even our physical strength is considered power, right? Even our vote is a form of power. Now we can use the second kind of power wisely and well, or we can misuse and abuse this power. Once more, the question is, my will or thy will? Let me give you a more local example of a conspiracy of goodness, although this wasn't done in secret. Instead, it was done in the open, and it was widely celebrated. It began last year when our youth and children's director, Christina Norville, heard a local doctor named Tom Dalton make a speech about a plan to end chronic homelessness here in Wilmington. The plan was called Eden Village, and the idea was and is to build affordable tiny homes where the homeless could live safely and securely. Inspired by this speech, Christina came back and talked to the staff of the church about it. She then reached out to Donna Hudson and the members of the outreach committee. She went back and got more information from Dr. Dalton. She then set up meetings where Dr. Dalton could come and talk with small groups here at the church about his idea. She asked if we could create a fundraising goal involving the entire church. And, well, you know what happened. You all saw and felt the very same needs that moved Christina. And you responded. Big time. You ended up donating $92,000 to Eden Village. Enough to buy two tiny homes. Now that's a conspiracy of goodness. But I don't know if that would have happened except for the fact that Christina used her power, her relationships, and her influence for a really good cause. How are you using your power and your influence at work, at home, out in the community? For thine is the kingdom and the power which leads to his glory. As we pray, thine is the glory, once more we're intentionally countering the natural tendency in our lives to seek glory for ourselves. As we've learned, there's this tendency within each of us to want to hallow our own names. We crave the glory. We want the credit for the good things that we do. We want people to be impressed by us. We want people to think highly of us. We brag, or sometimes humble brag, right? We show off. We work hard to impress others. We crave affirmation and applause, ribbons and trophies, recognition and praise. Well, it's not true of everybody, of course. There are some people who choose to remain in the background. They're often the very people who make anonymous gifts and donations because it's not about them. But many are driven by that need for recognition, for praise and for glory. Philippians 2 teaches us this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus glorified God by humbling himself and becoming a servant. Look at his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He doesn't ride into the city on an expensive, majestic steed. No, he comes riding in on the back of a donkey, one that he had to borrow. And then Thursday, you know, we celebrate Maundy Thursday. The word Maundy actually comes from a Latin word that gives us the word mandate and even the word commandment. Because on Thursday at the Last Supper, Jesus gave us a new commandment or a new mandate to love one another as he has loved us. How did he show that love? By washing his disciples' ugly, dirty, filthy, grimy, nasty, stinky feet. And then we get to Friday, when Jesus does the most selfless act ever, by dying on the cross for our sins. The Bible says it's this type of humility that brings God glory. 
For it is God's kingdom that we pledge our allegiance to and God's power that we use to transform the world around us and God's glory that we seek instead of our own. This prayer that Jesus taught us should be training our hearts and minds for the day when God's kingdom has fully come and God's will is completely done. Jesus gave us these words as a gift to help us know how and what to pray. He gave us these words to shape our lives, inviting us to embrace the love of our Father in heaven and to recall that he is as near as the air that we breathe. He hoped that we, he would, we would hallow God's name in our everyday life. He invites us to pray thy and thine instead of my and mine. His words beckon us to become the means by which God answers the prayers of others for the bread that they need, whether that bread be food or love or compassion or mercy. He invites us to seek forgiveness from God, but also to extend forgiveness to others. And in these sacred words, we ask God to lead us away from the evil that we find ourselves tempted to pursue. And in its powerful doxology, we recognize that the kingdom, the power, and the glory rightly belong to God and not to us. May these sacred words shape our hearts and lives every day. And through us, may they shape the world around us forever. Amen. We pray that prayer with me one more time. And this time, as we learned last week, let's, uh, let's put that comma after lead us or a little pause to remind us that God is leading us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
In so many ways, the Lord's Prayer is a simple prayer. It's a prayer that many of us say by rote and maybe don't think so much about. We've been saying it for years, decades even. But gosh, what important words. Jesus is literally teaching us how to pray, the things that we are to pray for. And so on this Palm Sunday, as we remember Jesus riding into Jerusalem with his triumphal entry, as the people shouted Hosanna, let us remember that when we pray and the actions that we live out when we pray are for God's kingdom, power, and glory. Amen. Go in peace.